tonight on Discovering Women. We can't afford that all of our research is devoted to the machine because what we're trying to learn about isn't the machine that we're building, it's the brain. I'm hoping that we'll, we will come up with a set of experiments that wind up shedding light on how the brain really works based on our experiences in the silicon medium. This hasn't happened yet. Um, and I think that it needs to happen before the biological community will look seriously enough at the silicon work to learn from it. If you look at your finger, first with the left eye and then with the right eye, the finger seems to be in two different places because each eye sees it from a slightly different point of view. By looking at that finger with both eyes, the brain locates exactly where it is. Stereo is an interesting problem because it's something that happens in the brain. By the time you get into cortex, you see a lot of activity resulting from the cortex itself. The brain is imagination. And that was exciting to me. I wanted to start building a chip that could imagine something. And stereo is the first and simplest problem where it's very clear that something is being imagined. There were three different video monitors that were used, one for each eye and one for the stereoscopic depth computation. Oscilloscopes, power supplies, voltage meters, two large tables full of equipment with blinking lights, and then the chips that I had built myself, which were by and large held together with wire tied in random places on the protoboard and sort of loose ends hanging off every which direction. One of my retina chips was quite touchy. The design wasn't ideal, and if you apply the wrong voltages to the chip, it has a tendency to latch up, which is, means it gets very hot. Sometimes it melts. <laughs> it's a bad thing. And these chips were so delicate that even though they had sent me 20-odd copies of the chip, I only had two left. And I needed two to do the demonstration because I was doing a binocular stereo demonstration. And I turned the power supply on, and there was a loose wire. Chip got really hot, and I thought, oh, no, I've ruined it. <laughs> this is the last chip, and it's never going to come alive again. But I took it out, let it cool down, put it back in, and it was fine. But it was the most harrowing moment. Your heart just pounds. When you're struggling with your thesis, there are so many dimensions to the struggle, and you really take a lot of it on yourself. And even though people around you are being supportive, somehow the emotional impact didn't come through to me until I saw them in the audience. And I really felt like I was explaining to them what all that pain and anguish and struggle had been about, and that they could share in the celebration of completion with me. But something has been resolved for Misha. She's realized that being both a biologist and an engineer have given her a valuable perspective her colleagues don't yet have. I think that it's going to take a lot of effort to demonstrate that engineering can bring specific understandings to biological systems, and even, perhaps even more work to demonstrate that understanding biological systems can give rise to new kinds of engineering solutions but there's no proof like uh, demonstration. The existence proof. So I just need to do it. Developing a sense of your own authority in a mixed group is very difficult because there's mm. the sort of, mm. I think, a cultural predisposition to give men authority. And if, if you're in a mixed group, you wind up having to fight that all the time. And then it becomes a dominant struggle, and that isn't what the group's about. Any fact in science can be reinterpreted. Any theory can be thrown out in favor of a new theory. It's not a building in the typical sense of the word, where if you took out the foundation stone, it would all crumble. It's more like a living thing where every piece is replaced continuously and yet the organism as a whole continues to be.